Good evening. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Please note that the opinions voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network nor our sponsors. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Reaching all the way back to 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown. All of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition. Here is your host of Fate Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am always so excited when I get a chance to speak with someone who knows what they're talking about, about something that I may not. And this is one of those topics that is not something I've researched, physically researched a whole lot. I've read a good bit here and there. I've been exposed to a lot of the information, but not by someone like our guest tonight. Scott Mardis is someone who is just amazing. He is a a naturalist. He is a cryptozoologist. He focuses primarily on freshwater biology and marine biology. He is someone who has, I think probably is the expert on the Lake Champlain monster champ. He has been on several television shows relevant to that, as well as obviously radio shows and podcasts all over the world. I am so fortunate because this is going to be a fantastic learning experience for me. Scott Martis, thank you for being here and welcome to Fate Mag Radio. Thank you for having me on. Well, I, I, in my archives, I have several old, old issues of Fate from the 1970s. Well, you should have a subscription now. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now... As near as I understand, this is put out by the Society for the Investigation of the Unexplained, right? No. Okay, maybe I'm thinking of something else, but I do have a bunch of old fate magazines. Well, there's fairly Uh, new ownership, and mm. it's pretty awesome. It is, um, well, I have the new issues that I am taking with me to conferences and stuff. So if you're at a con that I'm at, see me and you can get one I am I'm just excited about this magazine Phyllis the editor is brilliant she kind of got in a bind where she didn't have a lot of help with it and we have someone wonderful who has stepped in to help her and is helping with the website we're both thankful for that it's just a really great group of people that we're working you know as a team that's nice Mm -hmm. but i got a chance to interview um people who have had their stories in fate and the nice thing was that just recently i had cheryl costa on and she said well you know i submitted this story to fate magazine like 1996 2006 i don't even remember when it was but it was never published So I sent an email to Phyllis and I said, this is going to sound so weird, but, and you know, the minute I told her what the story was, which was that, um, well, you'll have to read it, but it was about Johnny Appleseed and time travel and wonderful things. The minute I I described it to her, she knew it. Sure. Uh, Facebook. Yep, she is interesting, but when she found out, when Phyllis found out that this was her story, she sent her two copies of that edition, and Cheryl didn't even know it had been published. (laughs) So it was a neat treat for both of them. Yeah. 
But yeah, she is to ufology numbers what you are to champ. Pretty yeah, daggum good. Yeah. I'm friends with another uh, Scottish ufologist named Malcolm Robinson. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I have not interviewed him, but I have heard of him. Yeah, he's also written a book on the Loch Ness Monster, too. I didn't know that. On Nessie. Yeah, it's a really good book. Yeah. Well, thank you for telling me, because I'm making a note of that. So that I can go and look that up. I love trying to find information that is not in my main field. So that I can broaden my mind and horizons. But Do you... Um... Do you do any field research <clears throat> yourself in any field? I do. I'm a paranormal investigator, and I am working to develop a parapsychology research team with someone here in Alabama. Well, you know Alex, Bobby Linsky, right? Oh, I do. He was on here not too long ago. He is fantastic. Yeah, and a, I've, par I've investigated but, with him, too. <clears throat> Yeah, we met at the uh, Creature Weekend about two years ago when I was giving a lecture there. And we've stayed in touch, and I've been on his podcast several times. He's pretty amazing. Yes. And he's come I've a very to... long way in a fairly short time. Yeah, I've got to check out his documentary, The uh, Madhouse. I still haven't got a copy <laughs> of it yet. Well, it's, it's pretty amazing. It seems to be going gangbusters. Yeah. Well, speaking of going gangbusters, you've been going gangbusters. And by the way, I love your boat. It's not that... mine. It belonged to my late partner, William Jorginus. Well, I like he, it. Uh... Well, yeah, I liked it too. Um, did you see uh, on the trail of Champ the small town monsters thing? I did not see that yet. Well, anyway, if you watch that documentary, that's the boat we were out in with the sonar on that documentary. My partner, Will Draganis, that was his boat, and he bought the sonar. And he was a aeronautical engineer and actually built the underwater cameras that we were using at the lake. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, unfortunately, he, de he developed pancreatic cancer and passed away oh no uh, yeah so um i'm kind of having to reboot start over again because i've lost all the equipment in the boat um yeah it's unfortunate but well it is happen. well but i am supposed to go back to the lake in august and the plan is to stay for six weeks to try to do a bunch of stuff so we'll see what happens but I'm, I'm still trying to continue the work that we were doing so well I have absolute faith that that will continue because it's pretty important work in my opinion you know you've yeah. got all of these things that you research and that you have been in the field searching for and you know you've got I'm going to say some of these wrongs and please do correct me but Plesiosaurs and Pleosaurs, Mosa or Mosasaurs? Mosasaurs. Mosasaurs. Yeah. Pinnipeds. Yeah. Now, are pinnipeds what it sounds like, like with centipedes, but bigger? Well, pinnipeds are, it's a scientific term for seals and sea lions. Really? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, when you hear somebody talking about pinnipeds, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about seals, sea lions, and walruses. And fur seals. Right. So the relative relevance of pinnipeds to the whole water monster thing is that some people believe that, that these long-necked plesiosaur-looking monsters may not be surviving plesiosaurs. They may, in fact, be giant long-necked seals that we don't know about that just look like plesiosaurs. So that's what that's about. Well, is that a realistic assumption? Well, yes and no. Um, a lot of the lakes 
that people report monsters from have a history of seals swimming up rivers and coming into the lakes, but they're usually recognized for what they are. <clears throat> Some people believe that normal seals get into these lakes and are mesaken for monsters, and in some marginal types of reports, that's entirely possible. Seals still get in and out of Loch Ness even today, and there's a long history of seals getting in and out of Lake Champlain back in the 1800s. There was one tried to get into Lake Champlain through the Champlain-Hudson Canal mm -hmm. back in 2016, which is fairly recent, but they caught it before it was able to get in. So, on the other hand, people <clears throat> report these long neck monsters with super long necks, which are longer than you would expect on a normal seal. And they're also much larger. We're talking about animals maybe 25, 30 feet long. They that know is that. much larger. That's huge. They know that. The elephant seal can get 20 feet long, but, but apparently the animals described in some of these monster reports are much larger, and their necks are, are super long compared to what we normally see with a, a pinniped. Well, that's what I was going to ask so, you, because elephant seals don't have that elongated neck, do they? Well, they can, they can make a long neck by stretching their neck out. But it's not as long as some of these reports of, of what people are, are describing as monsters. Getting to the monster reports, there is a subset of those where people describe manes of hair and whiskers, which you would not expect on a reptile. No. So because of the fact that people are reporting Whiskers and hair makes people think that, well, this must be a mammal of some sort, and the best fit that we can come up with, with a long neck, is some kind of giant long neck seal. However, on the downside, there's nothing like that really in the fossil record of that size. That doesn't mean it couldn't exist and we just haven't found it yet. It's possible it could be a relatively recent animal that only cropped up in the first, the last few thousand years. You know, and, and maybe it doesn't really have a conventional fossil record. True, but another, by the same token, wouldn't their I, fossil be closer to the surface if you were researching? Yeah, yeah, in theory. But if it's a relatively recent animal maybe the deposits that its dead bones are laying in are not in, in environments that have been buried deposited with sediment on top of them to preserve a fossil mm -hmm. like some animal that thousands or millions of years ago okay that's logical and the other the other downside is that the reported behavior of these quote, monsters, doesn't sound like what typical seal behavior is. Normally, well, you, you imagine seals, that you, you see them, they're, they're, they're gathered in groups on the beach, barking like dogs. Right. Or at least the ones we're, we're commonly familiar with. Yeah, they do appear to That's have family thing. units. Yeah, yeah. So if you had a bunch of, of giant... 20 foot long long neck seals with 10 foot long necks sitting on a beach barking like a dog there wouldn't be no mystery <laughs> yeah. true that but there would be a clear beach so, yeah uh, <clears throat> so that's one, one factor that seems to weigh against the idea so you've got pluses and minuses with a, with a long neck seal that we don't know about. You're, you're not talking about some prehistoric animal that's supposed to be extinct. You're also talking about a group of animals that have living representatives all over the world, so it's not like you're having to resurrect some lineage of animals that have been extinct for 60 million years. So, you know. That's pretty fascinating, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And the um, fact, when they have these sightings of what could possibly be a long neck elephant seal that's just kept growing, mm-hmm. then um, are they always singular in nature? For the most part. Okay. So um, that would also be um, aberrant behavior for a seal. Yeah. What well, about the walruses? Because I've seen them um, sing, you know, acting as singles. Yeah. And they do have some hair or, yep, wi- or big whiskers like a mustache and tusks. Yeah. So. And the real noticeable tusks. But the, th- the thing is, uh, you look at the fossil record of walruses. And most of the fossil walruses don't have those tusks like that. Really? So there's a whole series of, of some presumably extinct walrus that didn't have the big tusks. So they okay. would look more like an elephant seal, probably. Right. Yeah. But still with the mustache. I mean, I know the mustache doesn't go through the fossil fossil yeah. process well, but yeah. that would be a possibility for the hair. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, looking at the other side of the argument, the, the surviving plesiosaur idea, it's highly unlikely, but not impossible, that plesiosaurs could have had some kind of hair-like structures on the back of their neck or feelers or whiskers. I mean, you know, it's just like, based on what we know, they didn't have any kind of hair-like structure. Mm-hmm. There were other types of reptiles that were ancestral to mammals that did have whiskers and hair. If you could go back about, say, 250, 300 million years ago, you'd see animals that were like a cross between a dog and a Komodo dragon. Oh. That were ancestors of mammals. So, you know... There were, at one point in time, there were reptile-like animals that did have hair and whiskers. But there were a totally different branch of the reptile family than the plesiosaurs. They've actually found fossilized skin of plesiosaurs that shows that they had very small scales. But they also had blubber, too. Michael Whale? Yeah. So plesiosaurs were at least partially warm-blooded and could live in cold water. And there's a living, the largest known living reptile, marine reptile today, the leatherback turtle, also is partially Mm warm-blooded and has. So these arguments that, oh, the water in Loch Ness and Lake Champlain is too cold for a reptile really doesn't apply to animals like plesiosaurs or leatherback turtles because they have ways to generate internal heat and keep their body heat inside the body, unlike most reptiles. They have special networks of blood flow uh, arrangements that keep the warm blood inside the body. Their muscles are made to generate internal body heat, and they also have, like I said, they had blubber. And they found fossilized remains of blubber on plesiosaurs and another group of dinosaur-era marine reptiles called ichthyosaurs, which look like dolphins. I saw that word um, when I was reading one of your papers, and I had just started Googling as I was going. <laughs> so I'm glad that yeah. I had done that. But they're um, they're big. Yeah. Well, the thing you have to understand is that you've got two sets of data, essentially. You've got the monster reports where people report seeing things that resemble extinct marine vertebrates, which would be, you know, animals like reptiles and mammals. The animals that resemble the monster reports are animals that are supposed to have been extinct for millions and millions of years. Most of them existed in what we would call the pre-human era. Right. 
like what, what what we consider modern humanity has probably only existed for say roughly a hundred thousand years by that point in time most of these fossil animals that look like sea monsters were already extinct or gone at least as far as we know on the other hand you on this like I said we've got another set of data over here where people seem to be reporting animals that look like the ones we know from the fossil record. So we don't know yet what is really ultimately behind the monster reports. And I say this myself, having seen something in Lake Champlain that I couldn't explain, mm -hmm. that I believe is one of these champ animals. That Which, happened in 1994. Those look almost more like a, a brontosaur. Uh, but we are at our first break. We will be back right after this with Scott Mortis. Y'all come back. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Come on, I'm Southern, but um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... <laughs> uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? <laughs> I didn't say that. Awesome! Oh, <laughs> Son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown. All of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange and bizarre join host cat hops sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m eastern on wbhm digital broadcast you are listening to wbhm digital broadcasting birmingham alabama Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. And we're back. Thank you so much for being here and listening. We have got such a fantastic guest on tonight, Scott Martis. He is somebody who knows so much about lake monsters and freshwater and marine. He knows so much more than I know. I'm having a fantastic time. I've got a page and a half of notes already. But go ahead, Scott, because I am I know that I interrupted your train of thought as we were going. And yeah. did you want to finish that thought? Yeah, well essentially <clears throat> the job that the task that stands in front of people like me and other cryptozoologists who are trying to investigate, say, Sasquatch and all this, 
They've got a set of data of eyewitness reports, photographs, film and video, possibly audio evidence of animals making sounds, some of which sounds like animals that we know from the fossil record, mm -hmm. which it would be very nice if we would, could, could very quickly and neatly find one of these animals, verify that it is a living plesiosaur or a living gigantopithecus or whatever the creature you're looking for is. But that's, you know, it's, it, it's quite a task. The only thing that's ever going to connect the dots, if we're dealing with a living fossil, is to actually find a dead one or a piece of a dead one or get a tissue sample from a live one. Mm -hmm. You know, to verify that, yeah, okay, so this, this over here that people are seeing is a living specimen of this animal that's supposed to have been extinct for since so how many millions of years? Which that I'm happens trying, periodically, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm trying to, to move in that direction to the best of my ability. One thing I've been doing is looking for remains of dead ones in caves. And I've, last few years I've been carrying around with me a thing called a biopsy guard. And what that does, it's, it's, it's a, a dart, a projectile, that is relatively harmless. They use them in whale and shark research. Mm -hmm. It's a dart that you, you either shoot with a crossbow or a gun, or you can use a spear with the dart on the end of it. If you can get close enough to the animal, you touch the animal's skin, it takes a little plug of tissue out. It's relatively harmless, pain, painless to the animal. But with this one little piece of tissue, you could get DNA uh, strand and tell you what kind of animal it is, what it's related to, and would also give you genetic data about how healthy the population that this particular animal came from. Could probably give you information about how many are in the, the group that it came from and what their genetic history is, just from this one little piece of tissue. It could tell you how many are in its, yep. its group? Absolutely. That's cool. Um, so they do, this, they do this regularly with populations of sharks and whales. So it's just a question of being able to get up close enough to the animal to use this thing and preserve the tissue sample long enough to be able to analyze it in a laboratory. So that's one method I've been trying to do. Unfortunately, you know, one of these animals hasn't popped up close enough to the boat to use it yet. And the other strategy I was talking about is looking for bones of recently dead ones in caves that used to be underwater or possibly in caves that are still underwater. So far, I have found three caves at Lake Champlain that were once underwater thousands of years ago. Oh. And the significance of this is that 10,000 years ago, Lake Champlain was a marine embayment, and the water level was 200 feet higher than it is now. There were whales and seals living in that marine version of Lake Champlain, for which we have the fossil bones of. So theoretically, <clears throat> whatever champ is would have come in during this time period and got trapped mm -hmm. when the marine influence got cut off and adapted to fresh water. And this is theoretically possible because we know there are about three or four species of fish living in Lake Champlain now that are leftovers from that Time that it was marine they actually survived the transition that's what I was going to ask would they be able to survive going from marine to freshwater yeah well there there are seals that have done this there are landlocked populations of seals that used to be marine that are have adapted to freshwater now mm -hmm. so yes it's theoretically possible so the idea is that whatever champ is the, the simplest answer is some kind of leftover from the Champlain Sea. 
right. that has managed to adapt to fresh water. So if, if it's there and it's a flesh and blood animal, it dies and its remains are laying somewhere on the bottom of the lake or possibly in some of these underwater caves, if they exist. And what put me on this idea was that they know that sea turtles in certain places where there are underwater caves, they go in there and they die. Mm -hmm. They found mass burials of, of, of sea turtles inside of underwater caves. They're not sure if they go in there on purpose to die as a place that they'd normally go to die when it's time to die, or if they swim in these caves and, and can't figure out how to get back out and just suffocate and die because of that. But nevertheless, they do find groups of, of dead sea turtle bones laying in some of these underwater caves. And I'm thinking it's possible that maybe there could be a similar situation with whatever champ is. They also find bones of crocodiles and alligators and manatees. In the caves? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So... Not at Lake Champlain, but I'm talking about these fake. But yeah, I mean, average. Ocean. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the two most least invasive ideas I've come up with to get a type specimen, physical evidence of these animals without harming one. You know, the last well, thing I mean, I but you do don't want to take the last one out. No, absolutely not. They could be in the process of going extinct right now. Nobody knows. Right. We can't find them, you know. So all Which... I can say is that in 1994, I was watching the lake through binoculars, and I saw what appeared to me to be a large animal about 15 feet long with a big rounded humped back. It was a garbage bag color, a, kind of a greenish black, it swam for a few seconds, had what appeared to be some kind of appendage, either a head or a flipper sticking up out of the larger mound shape. Swam for a few seconds and then sank and was gone. I didn't have a camera to get a picture or, you know, video or anything. I never have a camera but, when I see something cool. But I did, I did see this through binoculars mm -hmm. and was able get a size estimate based on boats that I saw swimming by or going by in the same area. It was around so boaters? That, well, there were boats moving in the same area after it was gone. Right. Which I used to scale the animal, which is where I came up with a 15 feet wing. Right. It. Absolutely. So anyway, I saw this through binoculars with my own eyes. You know, I can't say for sure what it was. It looked like an animal to me. I can't explain it. You know, um, so that's my quote champ sighting, if you want to call it that. I mean, I'm being totally honest here. I believe it was an animal, and I believe it was probably one of these unknown creatures that is supposed to inhabit Lake Champlain. How long have the reports come through about this in Lake Champlain? Well, there's a long history. <clears throat> there's Indian lore about it from two different groups of Indians that lived on different sides of the lake before the white man ever got there. The earliest newspaper report is from 1808. Wow. Then you have an then you have another report from 1819, which is kind of shaky, but it's there. Then you don't really have another set of reports until the 1870s. From the 1870s up till now, there's been regular reports. So that's going on 150 years. That's astounding. To me, that's astounding. Yeah. yeah. Because I know that when I was perusing some of your material and information, um, I came across what what was an astounding size creature. 
I mean, it looked like half the town was lined up behind it to show how long it was. And it was it was said to be a basking shark, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. But they're not they're not actually shaped like that, are they? Don't well, they the have thing, the thing about basking sharks you have to understand. Okay. Basking shark is the second largest shark species known behind the whale shark. Mm -hmm. And it's a filter feeder like the whale shark, but it has a much more conventional sharky looking body and, and, and mm -hmm. shape. It looks like a sort of like a skinny great white shark with a really big mouth. It's got very tiny teeth. It's a filter feeder like, right. like the baleen whales and, and the whale shark. It's got this really giant mouth that it swims through the water with, straining plankton. Its gills have strainers on it that catch the plankton. They call, they're called gill rakers. They look like gills with pieces of hair on them. Mm -hmm. And what that's there for is to catch this plankton as they're swimming through the water, and it eventually goes down their gullet into their stomach. Well, the way sharks' skeletons are built, the skeleton is built out of cartilage, mm -hmm. the rubbery pieces of, of things you see on the end of chicken bones. You know what I'm talking about? I do. All right, that's cartilage. It's not hard like bone, but it's, it's a type of skeletal material. So anyway, the way the basking shark and most sharks' skeleton is built the jaws are a separate piece from the other part of the skull, the cranium. When a, when a basking shark dies, its body starts falling apart. One of the first things to fall off of the body are these giant jaws and the gill arches. So a lot of times they find the carcasses of basking sharks without the jaws without the gill arches. When that happens, what you have left on the main body of the shark is this small skull that looks like a turtle's head mm -hmm. and a bunch of backbones going back to where the front fins are, what they call the pectoral fins, the main fins in the front. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a long-necked animal with a small head because of those jaws and the gill arch is missing, it looks a lot like a, a plesiosaur. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole history, a long history, of people finding these carcasses laying on the beach that look like sea monsters. And really what they are, they're, they're half-rotten basking sharks where the jaws and the gill arches have fallen away. Right. Usually takes a scientist that knows what he's looking at to identify it for what it really is. Well, I would think so, because a person who comes across something like that, if I came across something like that, I would be unaware that it was missing a jaw. Although, I, I would yeah. think that you would notice that there wasn't something to be eating with. But still, it would be exciting and unusual and a little flippy. So, yeah, well, it happened multiple, multiple times. Right. I can a lot see of that. times you'll see a newspaper headline, Dead Sea Monster washes the shore at such and such place. And then a couple of days later, some marine biologist will come look at it and say, oh, that's a dead basking shark, or mm -hmm. it's a mutilated whale carcass, or it's a giant squid, it's a morph fish. There's all sorts of things that can happen. Well, that, that actually people... happened not too terribly long ago, didn't it? And it was, it was a very strange-looking animal, but... I just figured it was something that had been destroyed in some part. Yeah. Well, what specific case are you talking about? I can't remember which beach it came up on, but it was like a, a purple. It actually looked like it had suffocated or something like we would look oh. when we bruise or something, that color purple. Yeah. And it looked about maybe four feet long, the part that was still there. Oh. And I wish I could remember the beach. Because if I said that, you would know immediately. I will look during our break. 
Yeah. But but to me, and it's I usually, just. I usually try to stay on top of that stuff, you know. Well, this has been, this had to be at least three years ago, I would think. Yeah. But, but it came up on a public beach where people were, and everybody was like, ah, so. Well, there is one carcass <clears throat> that a lot of people think was probably a mutilated basking shark that there are questions about. This is the famous carcass that was pulled up off New Zealand back in 1977. They they refer to it as the, the New Zealand monster mm-hmm. or the Zeomaru carcass, which was the name of the ship that brought it up. <clears throat> but you'll see this in a lot of the creationist literature where they'll be talking about a dead plesiosaur was brought up from a, by a Japanese fishing boat off the coast of New Zealand in 1977. Well, despite some of the claims by the creationists, there is actually some legitimate questioning of the basking shark ID by people within the conventional biology field that has nothing to do with creationist claims. I mean, I'm not knocking creationism. Well, I would never, because... Yeah, you know. Everything started with a creator. But, I mean, we didn't just poof. But yeah, I I'm don't. just saying that in this context that that there is some questions, legitimate questions, about whether this plesiosaur-looking carcass was a basking shark. Right. It's a very interesting case, and it's it's probably at this point in time the best thing we got to point to to say that well, this over here could have been some kind of plesiosaurish-looking reptile. Mm-hmm. Some people actually said it was a reptile in 1978. So. I just mentioned that in passing. What was their science like at that point? Science. Would that, well, would that have been have, a legitimate claim that would they yeah. have known? Uh, well, part of the problem with that particular carcass is that it was rotten to the point that they threw it overboard. But they did cut some tissue samples from it, which they brought back. Oh, cool. And they took five photographs of it. But what a shame they threw it away. Yeah, if they had brought back the cranium and some of the vertebrae, there probably wouldn't be a question now. They would have been able to conclusively identify it. But because of the fact that they didn't bring that material back, there's always been a lot of questions. Like Some, some people say that the position of the rear flippers was too far back on the body for it to be a basking shark or any known species of fish. Interesting. But you know what? We're at our second break. This is going so fast. I can't believe it. But we will be right back, y'all. Y'all hang with us. And Scott, thank you. I can't wait to get back. Yep. Thank you. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in Paranormal Talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama.
Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Thank you so much for being with us tonight here on Fate Mag Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and my guest tonight is Scott Martis, who is a cryptozoologist who specializes in freshwater and marine biology. And he has just told me how to look at the the carcass that we were discussing a moment ago, and I will put that up on our page. But this is pretty, pretty astounding. Seriously. So, yeah. Scott, oh. do you feel, what did they find from the, the samples that they had? <laughs> well, they found out that the chemical composition of these fibers that were took from one of the flippers was almost identical to the chemical composition of the types of fibers that you find in the fins of basking sharks. However, there were some differences and part of the controversy about the chemical analysis of the fibers is that when they cut the tissue samples off the carcass on the boat, they put them in a chemical preservative called sodium hypochlorite, the type of bleach, mm-hmm. to preserve them in a jar. And there seems to have been some question about the effect that the chemical preservative that the fibers were put into may have changed the chemical composition somewhat when they did their test. Right. They did a second round of tests where they took basking shark fibers, known basking shark fibers, put them in the same chemical preservative, and then redid the test comparing them with those that had been treated with the same chemical. So they found that those were a closer match, but there's still a lot of question about how the the chemical preservative that the farmers were put in may have skewed the results. Right. Since the 1970s when this happened, During the course of my own research, I was able to find a paper on lizard claw chemical composition that said that possibly lizard claw uh, chemical composition had some of the same biochemistry. And the significance of that is if you look at the evolutionary history of plesiosaurs, they were descended, evolved from animals that had feet with claws. So it's entirely possible that the claws of their ancestors became fibrous material inside of their flippers. And they have found a fossilized plesiosaur over in Germany that had fibrous like things over its bones in its flipper. So looking at all this, we don't know yet what the chemical composition of the fossil fibers and plesiosaur flippers was yet. Maybe someday in the future we will when the when the technology to, to find out gets here. But anyway, taking all this and putting it together says it's possible that plesiosaurs could have had fibrous material in their flippers with possibly similar chemical composition that we just don't know yet. Wow. Yeah. So it's, you're getting in some really deep science here. It um, is really. I mean, it's I fascinating. I will say that in 1977 and 1978, the type of DNA analysis technology that exists today wasn't around. The best that they could do is do biochemistry comparisons with similar material from different types of animals. That's as far advanced as the technology was back then. However, I have found out that there is a surviving piece of one of the fibers from the 
carcass from 1977 sitting at a museum in Japan. And I've been trying to find out if, if it's still there and trying to get some biochemist to, to examine it and see if they can get a DNA sequence out of it. So far, I've had no takers, but I am still trying to pursue that. So we'll see what happens with that. I hope you find it. Yeah. Because I would love to see that outcome. Well, it was sitting in a museum in 1996. That's been... 23 years ago, so I don't know. Usually museums keep stuff like that and they put them in a cabinet somewhere and forget about mm -hmm. it. So I'm hoping it's still there. It was there in 1996. So That's we'll just amazing. What. I'm having to work around the language barrier, too. I don't speak Japanese, so. Well, most of, or a large part of their population does speak English. Yeah, so, I know. It's part of their education system, so that's, well, have Jap that's got to be have working Jap in your favor. I have Japanese friends. The Japanese TV network came over to Lake Champlain in 2016 to film a documentary, and I was part of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a few Japanese friends that I met through that. So we'll see I what happens. I think that will be so, it'll be so exciting. Yeah. Now, uh, you had a question about a platypus. We did. Brenda had a question about a platypus because she said, let me go back up to it. Um, she said, well, what about the platypus? It's an odd combination. Is it the only one that has survived over the years? I guess well, meaning like a hybrid kind yeah. of animal. Well, what a platypus is, it's an animal called a monotrain, mm -hmm. which is considered to be the most primitive form of mammal alive today. There is one other type besides the duckbill platypus, this animal called the echidna. It doesn't have a beak, bird's beak, like the platypus, but it lays eggs like a platypus. And one thing that most people don't know about the platypus, it's venomous too. I did not know that. Yeah, it's got a, it's got a claw that it uses as a weapon that is venomous on one of its uh, feet or hands. Um, but anyway, earlier I was talking about how there were these primitive ancestors of mammals, these mammal-like reptiles that had hair. These animals looked like a cross between a dog and a Komodo dragon. Mm -hmm. But they had hair and whiskers, but they laid eggs like most reptiles. Um, but some reptiles give live birth. But anyway... That is what a platypus is considered to be, is, is one of the most primitive types of mammals alive today. And it's so primitive that it lays eggs like some of its reptilian ancestors. That is just fascinating. Yeah. Because I used to it be amazed is, by platypus. It is a living fossil. And relevant to cryptozoology, it's important to, to point out that the first specimen of the duckbill platypus that was brought back for scientists to examine, there were accusations that it was a taxidermy hoax made, made out of a beaver and a, and a duck. I could see that. Yeah. I could see somebody so thinking you, that. Yeah. So you never know. You know, there's... there's <clears throat> A lot of people criticize cryptozoology, but I can point to three classic cases where three cryptozoology success stories. Now, the classic definition of cryptozoology is that you have a series of legends or reports of a supposedly mythical animal, then somebody goes to look for this animal, and in the success stories, finds a real animal behind the reports. Now, I know a lot of people like to point to the coelacanth in cryptozoology as, well, look here, they found this fish that's been extinct for 80 million years, and it's still alive. Well, the thing is, there weren't a lot of reports of people saying, oh, there's a, a monstrous fish here, 
a legendary fish, you know, we should go examine it. That's not how it happened. It was accidentally caught, totally unexpected, and brought back to a fish market where an ichthyologist happened to look over in this pile of fish and saw this weird fish and said, what is this? Oh, wow. Pulled it out, took it back to the museum, contacted another ichthyologist that she knew with a, and sent him a drawing of it. He said, oh, that's an animal, that's a, that's a coelacanth. That animal's supposed to have been extinct for 80 million years. So in other words, it was a totally unexpected find. Classic cryptozoology, as we understand it, is where you start out with reports of a monster or some kind of legendary creature that people are reporting but which has not been found yet. Then somebody goes and looks for it and finds a real animal. Now, say in the case of the Loch Ness Monster, the Yeti, or Bigfoot, we haven't found what we're looking for yet. Some people debate and say that, yes, we found the Yeti, and the Yeti is a bear, but that's a whole different controversy that I don't want to get into. But anyway, as far as Bigfoot and animals like Champ and Nancy go, we haven't found the animal yet. We suspect it's there, but we haven't found it. But there are three classic cases that I can point to from history where they did find it, and that's the gorilla the giant squid, and the Komodo dragon. Probably the most spectacular thing is the giant squid. There were reports for thousands and thousands of years of multi-headed, multi-armed sea monsters. Going back to Greek mythology, you had the hydra and all these other things, and yes. the kraken and all this stuff, you know. Finally, in the 1870s, for whatever reason, a bunch of dead giant squid washed up off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. After all these thousands of years of stories, and they had, prior to that, they had gotten bits and pieces of giant squids, but it hadn't been generally accepted. But for some reason, in Newfoundland in the 1870s, there were all these dead giant squids washed ashore to the point where they had so many that there was no denying it. And it was, it was given a species name, it was given our genus name, Architutus. Uh -huh. And so the, the giant squid, the kraken, was accepted by science in the 1870s. Then <clears throat> you go to Africa in the 1840s. <clears throat> the reports of these human-like monsters, hairy human-like monsters in Africa. Then they find them in the 1840s, and it's the gorilla. Somewhere in my archives, I have the original formal description paper of the gorilla. I think it's from like 1848, 46, oh, wow. somewhere. Yeah, so in that paper, it says, yeah, there were the reports of monsters, and nobody really believed it, and then they found it. So there's case number two, the gorilla. There's a different type of gorilla called the mountain gorilla that was discovered even later. This was like uh, 19, 1902, somewhere in there. And then the third case from 1912 is the Komodo dragon. People kept hearing reports of these monstrous dragon lizards on the islands of, in the Komodo archipelago. And... They went to investigate and found these giant lizards that can get 10, 12 feet long, that can kill a man, can hunt yes. down a deer. They're, they're, they're venomous. Their bite can cause your skin to rot. You know? So there's another example of a story that was not believed by a lot of people and was found to be based on a real animal. So there's three examples that I can point to to say, yes, sometimes cryptozoology is right, and there are real animals behind these crazy stories. Well, there would just about have to be with that kind of reporting, but it is the top of the hour. How does this happen? <laughs> I have no idea. But we will be back 
And this is a great time. If you have a tea glass you need to refill or a coffee mug or if you've got a tin cup chalice you just need something tossed into, let her rip and we will be back with Scott Mardish right after this. Thanks for listening. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. President Trump is addressing abortion for the first time since Alabama approved a highly restrictive law, saying he is pro-life but supports exceptions to an outright ban. NPR's Shannon Van Zandt has more. Trump tweeted that he is pro-life, with the exceptions of rape, incest, and protecting the life of the mother. He wrote that, quote, we must stick together and win for life in 2020, and warned that all of the, quote, hard-fought gains for life may disappear. Georgia and Alabama recently created new legal penalties for abortion. Alabama now only allows abortion if the mother's life is in danger. The new legislation is setting up likely legal battles, which may head to the Supreme Court and directly challenge Roe v. Wade. Missouri and Louisiana are moving forward on new restrictions on abortion as well. Shannon Van Sant, NPR News, Washington. The White House says it will roll out the first phase of its Mideast Peace Initiative by holding an economic conference in Bahrain next month. White House advisor and presidential son-in-law Jared Kushner says the workshop will focus on Palestinian economic development. The plan envisions large-scale investment and infrastructure work in the Palestinian territories, but the economic workshop isn't expected to tackle the major points of contention, including borders, the status of Jerusalem, Palestinian refugees, and Israel's security. Europe's far-right political parties are hoping to boost their power across the continent in European parliamentary elections next weekend. And Piers Oliner Beersley reports 12 populist parties rallied in Milan this weekend. Addressing the crowd in Italian, French far-right leader Marine Le Pen said the people are waking up all across Europe and there's going to be a democratic revolution. Since more than a million asylum seekers from Africa and the Middle East poured into Europe in 2015, far-right parties have seen their numbers grow. They've become the dominant political movements in much of former communist Eastern Europe and share power in coalitions in Austria and Italy. Now populist parties are hoping to win enough seats in upcoming parliamentary elections to constitute the third largest voting bloc in the European Parliament. Eleanor Beardsley, NPR News, Paris. In Iraq, a rocket exploded into Baghdad's heavily fortified green zone, less than a mile away from the U.S. Embassy. There were no casualties or damage reported. It comes amid heightened tensions across the Persian Gulf after the White House ordered warships and bombers to the region earlier this month to counter an alleged unexplained threat from Iran. The attack happened just a few days after the U.S. partially evacuated its embassy in Baghdad. Meanwhile, just days after saying he hoped two countries wouldn't go to war, President Trump today threatened Iran, tweeting that if the country wants to fight, it would be the official end of Iran. You're listening to NPR News from Washington. Chicago will swear in its first black female and openly gay mayor tomorrow. Lori Lightfoot, a former prosecutor and a political outsider, wrapped up her year-long listening tour by visiting a church today where she called on adults to be strong role models for young people. She won with 73 percent of the vote and won all 50 wards. Lightfoot will replace Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who did not run for a third term. Senior classmen at Morehouse College in Atlanta got more than a degree and congratulations at their graduation ceremony today. As Georgia Public Broadcasting's Robert Jimison reports, one of the commencement speakers announced a life-changing gift. Billionaire tech investor Robert Smith surprised 400 students and their families when he announced he would pay off the student loans for the entire class of 2019. My family is making a grant to eliminate their student loans. Before the commencement, the college announced that Smith had already donated $1.5 million to fund a new scholarship program and for outdoor improvements to the Atlanta campus. Last year, Smith, a graduate of Cornell University and Columbia Business School, gave a $1 million gift to Morehouse and received their top philanthropy award. Smith challenged the new graduates to pay it forward. For NPR News, I'm Robert Jimison in Atlanta. Over the objections of local gun owners, voters in Switzerland have approved a referendum to tighten the country's gun laws, bringing it in line with EU firearms rules, which were adopted two years ago after deadly attacks in France, Belgium, Germany, and Britain. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News from Washington.
You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. And we are back. Thank you so much for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio, and I am Kat Hobson, your host. Joining me tonight is Scott Martis, and I already have two pages of notes. I don't know how many you have. But I am learning so much. And Scott, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me on. You know, I was, I I neglected to say that you are a cryptozoologist who who focuses on marine and freshwater biology. But you also are one of the experts, I would say you're an expert, on the Lake Champlain monster. Yeah, that's where I've been. That's where I've done most of my field work. Actually, gone out looking, you know. Yep. And I, I've been doing that since 1992. I used you had to an live experience. there. Yeah, you had an experience yeah. there. Yep. And I used to live there for 18 years. Then I met my wife, who can't stand the cold weather, and wound I up moving that. to Florida. But I still go back every year in the summer, to continue my champ work. So, I'm still in the game. You know, I haven't quit. Well, and you live in Florida. So, you have a whole other side to be looking at. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get some expedition field work done here, too. I know several Florida cryptozoologists. I just haven't been able to get anything organized yet. But I am working on it. What I would ultimately like to do is look for Florida water monsters in the winter because we have such mild winters here. True. That's doable. And do the champ stuff in the summer. So I am going back to Lake Champlain in August. I um, I have a fundraiser on Go, GoFundMe that people can make donations. I could really use the help, too, because I have... I have to get me a plane ticket to come back to Florida after I'm done there. I've got the plane ticket up, and I've got some of my expense money and the equipment that I'm bringing with me, but I haven't been able to scrounge up the money yet to get my return ticket. So, Well, why don't you just it, tell it, people it, here what your GoFundMe is? Okay. Well, on GoFundMe, it's Lake Champlain Monster Hunt. So I'm trying to get together like $150 to cover... The return plane ticket, you know. I mean, I understand people are under stress and hard times, and I am myself, or I wouldn't be asking for help. So, well, but the easiest way to find it is to just Google Lake Champlain Monster Hunt, and it should take you right to it. Good deal. And that's C H A M P L A I N. Yeah, Lake Champlain. Well, yeah, Lake Champlain Monster Hunt should take you right to it. Yeah. There you go. Maybe this so, will help you, know, you. I hope so, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, very expensive. And now I've got the, you know, when I was living there, it was still expensive. But now I've got the added problem of, of getting back and forth a thousand miles. Mm-hmm. Going up and coming back, so. But anyway. Um, okay, we were talking about the classic cases of cryptozoology, the success story. Yes. Now, you contrast that with the hunt for the Loch Ness Monster, the Ogopogo, Bigfoot. We haven't had the breakthrough that we need in finding physical evidence of the alleged animals that are behind these reports and sightings. That doesn't mean that we won't eventually find it, but the fact that people have been hunting for Bigfoot for 60 years and the Yeti for 70 years and Nessie for almost 90 makes a lot of people skeptical that it's nothing more than just stories. Now, that's not the position I'm taking, 
but I just want people to understand how people that are not passionate about cryptozoology on the outside looking in look at this stuff. Good point. Yeah, I mean, you know, so <clears throat> the best thing that I find that impresses people in the Bigfoot field is the Patterson film. Yes. There, there's been lots of speculation that, oh, it's a guy in a suit, but nobody's been able to nail it down. We know for a fact it was done in 1967. There have been several special effects industry people that were the top of their game that have said that's better than anything I could have done in 1967, including a quote from John Chambers who did the apes in Planet of the Apes. You know, it's probably the most that's famous. Pretty, uh, that's pretty good stuff. Yeah, and nobody so far has been able to shake Bob Gimlin. Roger Patterson on his deathbed said it was authentic. So, you know, <clears throat> you have the Patterson film, you have a bunch of <clears throat> footprint casts, some of which has dermal ridges in it, which some people believe are authentic evidence of, of ridges on the skin, like, like a handprint or a fingerprint. There's mm -hmm. been a lot of debate about that some of that may be caused by the casting process, but still some people find a lot of that convincing. So regardless of whether you believe in Bigfoot as a real animal or not, something is going around making all these footprints in the woods. And this has not been explained away. And then you have the hair samples. Right. I get so is, frustrated when I, people I, tell I, me there's no physical evidence of Bigfoot. Well, the hair samples have been studied a lot lately by Melba Ketchum and, and Sykes and a bunch of different people. And some of it has been, quote, debunked, has turned out to be possum hair or some of the fibers are not even animal hair. They're like synthetic fibers from clothing and stuff of that nature. But however, there's a small subset that have been identified as human. But the thing is, the DNA of a chimpanzee and the DNA of a human being are almost identical. There's just a very small amount of difference. So perhaps some of these hair samples that have been dismissed as just being from a human, the difference may be so close it's hard to tell, you know? What is a key factor? You said chimpanzee DNA is almost identical to human. What differentiates it? Is it what is that minuscule differentiation that that may also let, apply to these? Let me Google that real quick. Okay. I'll tell you. Hang on. But I mean, it's just so fascinating because it's you know, all it would take would be. An anomaly. You know, you said it's a small subset. Well, with ufology, yeah. the Project Blue Book, the vast number of those were disproved, but there were 700 and something that were not. And those are the ones yeah. that nobody ever talks about because that yeah. is yeah. disclosure that, that those were. That. Yeah. But there's a lot of skeptics that want to completely dismiss the case for ufology and parapsychology and all that. And maybe there is a lot of stuff that can be dismissed, but there's a small hardcore of stuff that appears to be legit. Yes. That shouldn't be thrown out. You know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater is basically what I'm trying to say, you know. Well, I think you know, there's the... a little legitimacy, legitimacy in all these fields. I agree. And... Yeah. You know, with the UFOlogy thing, okay, those 25 or 2,800 were disproven. You came up with logical and reasonable explanations for them. So let's ditch those and let's go focus on these that had no explanation, the ones that you could not find logical conclusions for. Those are the ones right. that need to be talked about. 
I found the DNA thing about the human and chimpanzee. I'll just read it here. Okay. This is from the Smithsonian Institute. It says, while the genetic difference between individual humans today is minuscule, about 0.1% on average, study of the same aspects of the chimpanzee genome indicates a difference of about 1.2%. Okay. So it's really, really close, like 1% or something. Well, 1.1, 1. 1, yeah. You know, that's yeah. fascinating because that actually would be something to look at. You know, but you would have to have something that was absolutely not human. You know, something that was unknown and then be able to compare human to that and find out what that percentile was. That would be interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just, I don't mean to be getting off on a Bigfoot tangent here, but That's I'm just okay. trying to. That was just an interesting thing. I can use, I can use the controversies about Bigfoot to illuminate controversies about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's so much debate about the legitimacy of what Melba Ketchum did. You know? Yes. There, there's like, and, and it depends on your point of view. You know, like, she's saying that, okay, these hair samples have a mixture of standard human mixed with something unknown. People that don't want to find her research valid are saying, well, the reason it's that you've got this unknown element in here is that it's contaminated. It's not a fresh sample. So that's how they're able to, to you know, dismiss her findings. I'm not saying that's what I think. I don't know. I'm not a DNA expert. You know? Right. Saying when you're dealing with a quantity of, of things that are unknown, you can either say that, okay, well, we just don't know yet, or you can throw it in the garbage, depending on whichever way that you're inquiring to think. But that doesn't mean just because you want to throw it in the garbage that everybody looks at it that way. Exactly. You see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. I do. I understand that, and I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, there must be something there in the Bigfoot field for people to take seriously, because you've got people like Grover Kranz, and Jeff Meldrum, who are anthropologists that took it seriously and are still yes. taking it seriously. So regardless of whoever wants to laugh at all this stuff, like I said before, even if you say there is no Bigfoot, what in the hell is leaving all these footprints in the woods? And what are people seeing? Yeah, and what are people seeing? You know, I'm sure that occasionally there are sightings where people misidentify a bear once in a blue moon, but I, I find it hard to believe that they're all like that, you know? Well, or as close as they are, some of those people would be eaten. Yeah. If they were mistaken those for bear. And anybody that on a regular basis dresses up in a Bigfoot suit and goes walk around the woods is taking an awful risk of getting shot. They are. So I don't think you've got very many people that are out there on a regular basis, walk around the woods where people go hunting in a Bigfoot suit. I would I mean, agree with like, you. That'd be like jumping off a boat into a nest of great whites with a steak, a bloody steak <laughs> hanging on your neck, you know? Yes, you're absolutely you, right. And you you're from this area, and you know that's true. Because, yeah. you know, I was telling you about Jonathan Odom, who is Alabama Paranormal and Bigfoot, and... He does go into the woods quite a lot. He is familiar with the Talladega National Forest. He has sightings. He has film. It's just fascinating to me because there's no way I'd be in the woods after dark like that alone. And usually he does have at least one person with him, but not yeah. always. But Well, now, hunting for Bigfoot, you're going out into the woods. You're not having to get in the water. Right. I mean... There's a lot of woods. <laughs> there's a lot of dangerous stuff living in the woods. Yes. But you can walk around the woods, right? Right. Okay, 
I'd the rather be in the water. That <laughs> the quarry that I'm hunting is hiding under two, three hundred, four hundred feet of water. Yes. Body of water, 129 miles long, and 11 miles wide at its widest point. You get out in the middle of that in a boat, and it's just like being out in the ocean. Yes, it is. Okay, now Lake Champlain is big, but compared to a place like Lake Superior, which is a thousand feet deep, it's like a mud hole. Yes. Yeah. So modern day Lake Champlain is a staggering body of water. It's five times longer than Loch Ness, but only half as deep. But it's deep. still, yeah, it's still a task. And I think, I believe there's something behind the reports of the Lake Champlain monster. I can't prove it yet. I believe it's there, but I can't prove it yet. But I do believe that the only way you're ever going to find it is you're going to have to go down where it's living at under all that water. I think yeah. they probably stay close to the bottom. They probably hug the sides. Otherwise... They'd be regularly seen on sonar. They are, I believe they are occasionally seen on sonar. And I think possibly in 2017, me and my partner, William Jagrenis, got one on sonar. Well, you're gonna have to, I'm going to have to interrupt you and save that for after our break because we're late. Yep. All but right. We'll be right back, y'all. Come on back. This is going to be interesting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Come on, I'm Southern, but, um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... <laughs> uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? I didn't say that. Awesome! <laughs> son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am with my guest, Scott Mortis. And Scott, you had just been telling us that they 
They hug the sides and kind of avoid people they, and radar, possibly. But you, you think that Will that caught one? I believe that that's probably the situation with Champ and probably also the situation with the Loch Ness Monster. There's no evidence in Loch Ness of underwater caves. However, 3D side scan sonar readouts of the bottom and the sides of Loch Ness seem to show that there are all kinds of crags and depressions in the sides of Loch Ness, big enough for something to hide in if it wanted to kind of hunker down mm -hmm. into a crag in the side of the walls of Loch Ness that it could probably hide from sonar. Also, on the bottom of Loch Ness, and to a similar degree on the bottom of Lake Champlain, there's a deep layer of sediment, of mud, that an animal could theoretically hide under and avoid detection by sonar. Just kind of burrow in? Think, yeah. And they okay. think whatever these theoretical creatures are, champs and nassies, that they primarily feed on fish and that they are probably what you call an ambush predator. Mm -hmm. What an ambush predator does is it hides somewhere waiting for its prey to come by and then surprises it, snaps out, grabs it, and then eats it. So if these animals are ambush predators, it would make perfect sense that they regularly hide in order to make their living, in order to eat. So you would expect them to be hiding along the sides or on the bottom or where drop-offs are near the mouths of rivers and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff, eating fish, most likely. They know that plesiosaurs ate fish. We know that seals, the ones we know about and possibly unknown ones, are probably fish eaters. In Loch Ness, that's about all there is to eat because there's not a lot of vegetation because of the darkness of the water, the sunlight can't penetrate down to create a lot of vegetation mm -hmm. in the food chain of Loch Ness. So about the only thing there is to eat for a large animal in Loch Ness is fish and possibly water birds and a few amphibians. Right. Now, <clears throat> Lake Champlain itself is much more biodiverse than Loch Ness. You have 80 different kinds of fish in Lake Champlain, and some of those fish are types of fish that have gone extinct in places like Europe, Africa, and Asia. Yet they're thriving here in North America, fishes like the gars. Oh, and the those bowfin. are such big fish. You know what a bowfin is? No. They call them blackfish, they call them dogfish, grinnels is another name for them. They're a prehistoric ill-looking fish that over in Asia and other places, they've been extinct since almost the age of the dinosaurs. But they're thriving here in North America, and sturgeons go back to the time of the dinosaurs too. I did you can know find that. All those, you can find all those fish in Lake Champlain. And... Possible, a possible significance is the fact that these sea monsters from the age of dinosaurs and the prehistoric whales that have also been put forward as possible candidates to identify these lake monsters, all these animals that occasionally went up into rivers would have been eating these fish back millions of years ago. And they might have been following them. Exactly. Yeah. Following the fish so source. If there is... If there is a living plesiosaur or colony of plesiosaurs in Lake Champlain, it's going to be right at home because some of the fish that its ancestors ate millions and millions of years ago are thriving in these lakes. So anyway, um, looking at Loch Ness, the most impressive evidence over the years, most people come back to the underwater photographic evidence that was gathered the 1970s by Robert Rines and his people called the Academy of Applied Sciences out of Boston. They took a series of underwater 
photographs back in the early and mid-1970s, some of which appear to show flipper-like appendages, another one which shows what appears to be the front end of some kind of animal with a long neck, a large body, and two flipper-like appendages on the front end of its body. Basically, it looks like the front end of a long-necked plesiosaur. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a piece of motion picture film that was shot in 1960 by a guy named Tim Dinsdale of this large hump-like object moving across the surface of Loch Ness. Most people that believe there is a Loch Ness monster, that is the key evidence that they point to to say, this makes me believe there is an animal in Loch Ness. Now this animal, this, the best of this evidence is 50 and 60 years old. However, you know, if you are willing to look at it with an open mind, it's still very impressive. These flipper-like appendages that were photographed in 1972 look almost identical to modern reconstructions of what they believe plesiosaur flippers look like. And that has changed over the years, and there's no way in 1972 they could have known what modern plesiosaur flipper reconstructions today would have looked like. That's a fascinating point. I think, I think that's significant. Yes. However, there is controversy about these underwater photographs and that some of them were computer processed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, which is a division of NASA. What they do is they take photographs from space of planets run them through a computer program that is supposed to clean up the image and give it better clarity by using a computer program that is designed to remove visual artifacts from the original image. Okay, they took the same technology which they had used to clean up photographs from outer space and applied them to these underwater photographs at Loch Ness. There were several different programs that were used. Additionally to this, once these computer enhancements were done, there were, was another photographic expert, and Charlie Wyckoff ran them through computer filter color programs, which was supposed to have brought out other elements from the image that couldn't be produced from the original computer scan. So the final images of what these flippers were believed to look like was the result of taking these computer enhancements and these color filter versions that Charlie Wyckoff did, taking all of those and sandwiched them together into one image, if you can understand what I'm talking about. I can. It's like, it's like taking, you, you take the same photograph and you run it through different computer programs to bring out visual elements that are supposedly from the original image that aren't easily discerned, and then you take that and run that through different color filters to bring out different aspects. Then you take all these different versions of the same photograph and you combine them into one image. Okay, supposedly that is what the final images of these filters are made of, uh, flippers are made out of, is all those different images combined into one. Now, Let me ask a question we're... here. Yeah, go ahead. Is there an original file or an original film of the initial video? Yes. yes. There is an un untouched yes. copy of the original Absolutely. video. There's actually two. There's actually two images that are supposedly taken 40 seconds apart of what may be the same flipper in front of this camera. And in the second image, it's moved into a different position. So it's clearly, if it's the same object, it's moved. Right. Which would say that this is a lie, you know. But well, anyway. There's no reason to doubt that it's the same thing. Yeah. There's been a lot of controversy over the years because of the complexities of the photographic techniques that the original image was put through. A lot of 
critics have said, well, we don't know if this was built up, fabricated on a computer, or retouched, or um, airbrushed, or what. You know, there's a lot of questions of people that are skeptical about it, have used to debunk these images over the years. And in some cases, they took only one of the enhancements that was used to build the original image and said, okay, see this over here? It doesn't look like the final image. Well, it's not supposed to. The final <laughs> image was made a bunch of different enhancements and sandwiched together. Don't you love when they're looking for a gotcha moment and they don't have all their information? Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's been a lot of a lot of digging and poking at these images to try to debunk them. Mm -hmm. And some people think that there's been so many unanswered questions that, that they are debunked and can just throw them in the garbage, which that's their prerogative. There's nothing I can do about that. That's true. But the first image, the first flipper image, you can look at the unenhanced image and see the basic outlines of some kind of a diamond-shaped flipper in the original unenhanced version. People who are skeptical of that say, oh, you've already seen the final image, and you're seeing the final image inside the original picture as pareidolia. You know what pareidolia right. is, right? Uh, indeed. So, they're saying. so anyway, you've got these underwater photographs that look like Loch Ness Monsters, or pieces of Loch Ness Monsters. Then you have this film, which is totally independent from those pictures, of this large hump-like object that's believed to be about six feet long and about three feet high, swimming across the surface of Loch Ness. And there's no doubt that it was filmed at Loch Ness because you can see familiar objects and landmarks in the background. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely shot at Loch Ness. The controversy about that film, some people believe that it was a boat and that it was so far away and that the image resolution is so bad that you can't tell it's a boat because of the, the, the film quality and the distance involved. So, but a lot of people have said they don't believe it's a boat because of the way the, the, the wake it's making doesn't look like the wake coming from a, a, a boat motor. So there's another maybe piece of evidence, but most people that take the Loch Ness Monster seriously that's the evidence that they point to and say, yes, I, this makes me believe there is a Loch Ness Monster. So that's where you are with that. And, and we may have an answer very soon regarding Nessie because they've, they've done this DNA exper uh, e environmental DNA experiment. And we're, everybody's waiting with break, breathless to, to get the results of that. Explain an environmental DNA test to me, if you would. All right. What that is, is they're, <clears throat> they're taking water samples, and they've already proven this technology works. They've used it on fish and shark studies. What they do is they go to a place, they take water samples, and what they're looking for in the water are the dead skin cells of animals that live in this particular body of water. So what they can do is they can find shed skin cells and extract DNA from those shed skin cells. And they can say, well, say, say you've got a lake and you go and get water samples and then retrieve these dead skin cells out of the lake. You can you figure out, that, well, this, this skin cell come from this animal because it's got this DNA sequence. And this other cell over here came from a different type of animal. It's, and you can, you can actually tell the different type of fish that are living in this body of water. You can, you can basically do an environmental inventory just from dead skin cells. So they that have gone to Loch Ness. Yeah. They, this past uh, year, they went to Loch Ness and took a bunch of water samples of different parts of the lake, and everybody is waiting with braided, bated breath for the results, which hopefully will be out in a couple of months. So, Do you know if, the areas that they went? I mean, did they go along the shoreline? Did they go in the crags? Did they go down into the? Did they go like, into the core of the sediment? 
they I, I don't know. Uh, they they went out in a boat. They have taken cores, sediment cores at Loch Ness and Lake Champlain before, but those weren't for DNA studies. Those were for trying to figure out the geologic history mm-hmm. of deposition during the Ice Age in the lakes. Uh, as far as I know, they went out in boats and just took water samples out in the deep part of the water. That's all I've seen on the video. Yeah. I'm sure when, when the results are published, they will probably give a detailed account of where they went and how they did it and all that stuff. That's usually in the materials and methods part of a scientific paper. Right. Yeah. So I'm sure they'll go into all that in the final analysis. I have seen videos of them out in the boat putting the water sampler thing down and getting water samples. So if if there is a physical Loch Ness monster, there's a very good chance that we're going to know about it in the very near future based on this eDNA study, unless somebody has decided to cover it up or something. Which well, that's I'm what I was going to ask you. Would there be any reason necessarily for that to be covered up? Because it wouldn't be like in ufology where you have things like variated skulls and stuff that are so far from the norm that keep yeah. coming back with, well, you know, human, 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 but I wouldn't there wouldn't see be any reason. real motivation. Yeah, I don't see any reason why there would be a motivation to cover it up. I would think most of the people, even some of the hardcore skeptics, would love it if there was a Loch Ness Monster. Well, it was I'm certainly sure at the tourism. You're wrong, you know? So, I, I would think that possibly, I happen to believe that Champ and the Loch Ness Monster, if they exist, probably share a common ancestor from the Atlantic Ocean. Mm-hmm. Because both bodies of water used to be connected to the sea for brief periods at the end of the last ice age, when all this ice melted and flooded, they both became marine embankments. So, if they find nothing in Loch Ness, I think that has dire consequences for whatever is happening at Lake Champlain, because I happen to believe the reports are almost identical. Now, I don't know if that is psychological psychological contamination from people being familiar with what the Loch Ness Monster looks like, and then seeing something in Lake Champlain and having the image of the Loch Ness Monster in their mind and that coloring what they're seeing at Lake Champlain. I don't know if that's what's going on or if they're actually seeing the same type of animal that are closely related, that are cousins, that got separated and slightly evolved in different directions. Sounds like it's Lake a possibility. Champlain. Yeah. But, but we are reports... at our... Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say we've got to run on this break. But we'll be right back. And we'll be right back with our final segment. So if you have questions, get them in chat. You can go to our Spreaker page or you can go to WBHM-DB.com. Hit live chat and pop them in there. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama.
Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Hello, welcome back to our final segment here with Scott Martis. And I know that y'all have enjoyed this every bit as much as I have. Some of y'all are probably a little bit more knowledgeable on this topic than me. I have been taking notes like nobody's business. And I think that I think that you may be challenging Dave Considine for the guest that has me with the most full notepad here at the end of the show. But Scott, thank you so much for being here. I'm having so much fun and I'm learning so much. Can you see that picture I just sent? Did you send it in Skype? Yeah. Or, and, okay, let me go and look. Oh, it's, oh, yes. Oh, I have this picture. And I think y'all, yeah. if you're listening, that y'all have seen this picture in the video. So you can go and check it out. And if not, I'll post this on my website, on the Fake Mag Radio website. But Scott, since this <laughs> is our, our final segment, I wanted you to go ahead and let people know how to get in touch with you if they have questions and to be able I know you have several Facebook pages. Yep. And I have I have a group <clears throat> about the Champ Research on Facebook called Champ Lake Champlain Monster Research by Scott Martis William Jaganis, which is the name of my late partner that helped me until he passed away. Then I have a more general Facebook group, which covers Champ, the Loch Ness Monster, Sea Servants, the whole bunch of it, called the Zombie Plesiosaur Society. Then I have another page, which I started back in 2011, called Lake Champlain Mystery Animals. So those are the three main groups that I do most of my work in. I also am an administrator and participate in uh, Kevin's group, Lake Monstrosities. I do a All podcast. All of those are good, by the way. Yeah. I do my own podcast show about the stuff called The Haunted Sea on Monster X Radio, so I'm part of that group. And I, uh, I also do some work in the National Cryptid Society group, which is Jesse James Dirtle and his people. So... You know, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all over the place, really. You really are, and you have a book, which I love the yep. title of. <laughs> yeah. Well, what that book is, I took a bunch of papers that I had written previously, a bunch of articles, mm -hmm. and I threw them all together because they're all kind of the same, similar subject matter, and put it out as an ebook. And all of the proceeds from the sales of the ebook, which is very cheap at seven dollars, go toward the research. So I'm also in the process of putting together two more, one about Champ and also one about the Zuyo Maru carcass case that I was talking about. So hopefully uh, at the latest, when I get back from Lake Champlain in September, uh, I'll be putting those out too. If not before. Well, and I I've can't got wait. The, uh, Tell I've got them the name the, uh, of your book, Scott. Night of the Living Dead Plesiosaurs. There you go. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we don't know if these animals are plesiosaurs yet, but what people seem to be describing is very plesiosaur-like, so it wouldn't surprise me if that is the ultimate answer. But like I said, we won't know until we verify that there is an animal there. Mm -hmm. Then we find out what kind of animal it is. So we've got a two-step process. I believe there's an animal there, and all the people that claim to have seen it believe there's an animal there, too. But we and haven't been lot. able to... In order for it to be accepted as a real animal, you have to have a type specimen, which is a, a piece of an animal or a dead carcass or something that can be examined in a laboratory and, and classified and said, yet yeah, this is this animal, and they give it a Latin 
name and it officially becomes a real animal. And as I said earlier, there are classic cases of cryptozoology from the past where that did happen and it was successful. However, we're not there yet with things like Bigfoot, Nessie, and Champ. Um, while I do have time, I would like to mention that I find the most impressive evidence for the Lake Champlain monster in one photograph and two videos. The first one is Sander Monzi's 1977 famous photograph of Champ, which I'm sure you've probably already seen. It's probably the most famous mm -hmm. piece of photographic evidence for the Lake Champlain monster. Then there's a video shot in 2005, which is generally referred to as the Bodette video, where you see off the side of this guy's boat, you see some kind of a long neck looking object with a plesiosaur snake-like head on the end of it, moving its head up and down. And then during the course of the video, some kind of flipper-like object comes out mm -hmm. from the right side of it, and then it swims away. If your people want to see this, the easiest way to find it is to go on YouTube and Google Lake Champlain Monster on ABC News. Then there's a video shot in 2009 at a place called Oak Ridge Park of what looks like a giant turtle-ish looking animal about six feet long. That's what is referred to as the Eric Olson video. And the way to find it on YouTube is to Google Strange Sighting on Lake Champlain. And it should take you right to it. So those are the three most impressive pieces of video evidence for the Lake Champlain monster, in my opinion. I think so, too, because I've looked at those. I have been, I've been interested in this for so long, but I don't have any field experience. And it's tough to, to make a decision looking at videos. Yeah. So yeah. when I get well, a chance to talk to someone who has your field experience, yeah. it's much, it's much more understandable, and all of us have gained from listening to you share your your research and your work. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that because that's been amazing. Yeah, yeah, but, and um, you know, like I said, I I find those three pieces of evidence intriguing but there are other people out there that have said all sorts of you know questions like oh those that could be a piece of wood debris or it could be a hoax it could be somebody dragging a model or you know all sorts of alternate explanations it could be a a fish shot at an unusual angle and all sorts of things but all i can tell you is go look at this stuff if you want to have deeper analysis, go read all the material that's been written about it and analyze it and mm -hmm. make up your own mind, you know. Well, it's always well, better to do that. You don't want to go yeah. by someone just filling your head, negative or positive. No, you I look... always encourage everybody to, to go out and look at everything, to look at the skeptical explanations and theories, look at the original claims, and make up your own mind because, you know, don't get upset about what anybody says about anything, because if these animals really exist, nothing that anybody says is going to change that fact. True. If they don't exist, all the talking in the world is not going to make them exist. So, you know, words are only words, but they're ideas and very important. But, you know, we're not going to have a final answer until we find, like I said, a... a a physical flesh and blood animal. If this stuff continues to go on after we've verified that there's not a physical animal, then you have to go ask other questions. Is this some kind of supernatural entity of some sort, you know? But if you go there, you're not only having to ask questions about what we know about biology, but you're also having to question the laws of physics as well. True. Then you're off the then you're off the parapsychology land, you know. <laughs> so. Yes, you are. I'm not and... ready to go yet. 
that in myself. I still think it's a flesh and blood animal. But. I think it is too. I mean, just my personal opinion based on my own research and going through and reading experts and looking at different writings, some of yours, some of other people's. And, you know, it just is something that you really do have to make your mind up about because, like I said, with the with the UFOlogy, they told us all about the 25 or 600, 2700 that were not yeah unusual but they don't ever talk about the 700 plus that were unexplained and jay ellen hannick jay ellen hannick started out as a skeptic and there was enough evidence there to make him change his mind yes and most people that actually go into researching these anomalous issues wind up finding enough evidence to make them at least go hmm so you know it's just always, yeah. it's good to keep your mind open, just not so far that your brain falls out. Exactly. So, be a leader in your own research, but learn from people that have the knowledge. Make sure of your sources. Like Scott Mortis, great source. So Thank you. <laughs> call him as I see him. I'm not always nice, but I am always honest. I actually am mostly nice. But... Well, do you have anything coming up other than getting to Lake Champlain in, in August, uh -huh. September? You'll be coming home in that's September. All, that's all I'm aware of at this point. You know, you never know. I mean, sometimes out of the blue, I'll get contacted by some TV documentary producer. Oh, actually, yes. I'm going to be in a documentary called Science Friction. It should be coming to Netflix. Oh, that sounds Probably fun. Sometime. Sometime in the fall, it's a documentary about how scientists and other experts are sometimes misrepresented on uh, television programs by being re-edited and all sorts of stuff like that. I've so heard that, a lot of complaints gonna, about that. Yeah, well, that's what this is. This documentary is, is supposed to be addressing. So I highly recommend checking that out when it comes out. I will. Yeah. And that's going to be, you said, on Netflix, you believe? Probably, most likely. That's the story I've been hearing from okay. the producers. It's probably going to be coming to Netflix probably fall, early winter, sometime in there. I'll be looking for that. And for those that didn't hear, Science Friction. How fun is that title? So yeah. definitely something I'm going to be checking out. And I want to let people know that I will be back next Wednesday with my guest, Alan Pachinko. And I am so excited because he is astounding. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, check the Paranormal Experience webpage, Facebook page, all of the above, and I will have information about him. So it'll be fun. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thank you just, for having me on. I'm I'm always looking for people to 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 get behind what I'm trying to do and help me, you know. And I am. <clears throat> Thanks. I am behind what you do. So. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Certainly. And for everyone listening, thank you so much for doing that. You know, y'all are the reason that we do these shows and we couldn't, we could do them without you, but there'd be no fun in that. We like having people in chat. We like having people coming back to us with questions about our guests and we can get you in touch with them if you can't, you know, have time to write the information. Like if you're on your mobile and you're driving, do not write the information. But don't forget that tomorrow night is going to be the Paranormal Pride with Denise Pride Moore. We're dark on Tuesday. Wednesday is Paranormal Experience Radio with Kat Hobson. Thursday is Periscope Uncensored. Friday's a big night. We start with the Maliks on Paraversal Universe, followed by Ghost Talk Radio with Shelley Burke Robertson, followed by Seraphine Hurley, Trip in the Void. Always fun. So on behalf of our sponsors and our WBHM digital broadcasting hosts and myself, 
Thank you again so much. Y'all have a great night. Stay safe and be the change you want to see in the world. You can do it because you know what? It matters. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio.